Listen, thanks for joining us this late afternoon. We're gonna to go together for about a uh, little over an hour um, to spend some time talking about a very special place near and dear to my heart and all of our panelists. And I'm presuming all of those who are joining in the audience. So thank you for joining. We have an amazing panel. So to kick us off, I'm gonna ask each panelist to come in and um, introduce themselves properly um, because you know people wanna hear from you and, and know your experience. And then we're gonna go kind of deep into um, your backgrounds, your organizations, your thoughts on both Detroit's challenges and, and the opportunities that lie ahead for us. So without further ado, could I start with you, Irma? Irma Lephart from Sierra Club. Thank you, Carrie, appreciate that. Um, I'm so happy to be here, uh, the other panelists and with all of you to talk about something that's near and dear to me and that's Detroit and sustainability and resiliency. I work for the Sierra Club, Michigan chapter, and in that work, I serve as the Sierra Club representative with the Healing Our Waters Great Lakes Coalition. Uh, the coalition uh, is, has organizational members throughout the eight Great Lakes states. There are 160 member organizations. Um, I serve as the state co-state lead here in Michigan. And we work to advocate and educate our members of Congress uh, policymakers and others on all the, uh, the, the vital necessity of restoring and protecting the Great Lakes. We work uh, for additional funding and programs that will indeed um, allow us to protect our freshwater resource. Thank you. So happy to be here. Thank you, Irma. It's an honor to be with you. Lapricia Daniels from Detroit is working for environmental justice. Hi, uh, thank you so much for having me this late gloomy afternoon, um, but happy to be here with all of you. My name is Lapricia Daniels. I am a native Detroiter. I was born, raised, educated, and churched right here in Detroit. Um, I am old enough to remember when Hudson's department store was downtown. Uh, <laughs> and so I am a true Detroiter. I, I got a thumbs up from a couple of folks. Um, so I am a public health social worker, having earned my master's in public health and master's in social work from University of Michigan. And I really use my training, my education, and my love for the city um, and my current work as executive director of Detroiters Working for Environmental Justice. And DWEJ started off um, in the early to mid 90s. Um, as a group that was really formed to elevate the voices of impacted communities. So those that are impacted by environmental injustice and really took a grassroots approach to that. And that is really the work that we're known for and how we have woven and, and brought uh, community members and community voices to the table as pol policy decisions have been made um, at the local level as well as the state level. So. Again, honored to be here and um, looking forward to hearing from all the other panelists and adding what I can to this conversation. Thank you, Lapricia. Raquel Garcia. Hi, and thank you for having me. Um, my name is Raquel and I am the executive director of Southwest Detroit Environmental Vision. Um, I live and work in Southwest Detroit, um, environmental, Southwest Detroit Environmental Vision. Um, focuses on land and water projects, um, a little bit of beautification and cleanup, um, stormwater infrastructure, um, education in the neighborhood, also knocking on doors and talking to residents to see what their needs are, especially now around flooding and connecting them to resources. Um, as many as our, of our residents are other language speakers, um, Spanish speaking, Arabic speaking, and so there's a lot of need um, to, especially now in this moment, to find out if um, people are connected to the resources that they need. Um, our clean air, our healthy air um, department um, works on reducing emissions in Southwest Detroit. So um, there's a lot of asthma all over Detroit. Um, and in Southwest Detroit, we have a lot of um, trucks in our, in, on our residential streets, um, lots of emissions and pollution. Uh, reaching um, uh, underdeveloped uh, young lungs. And so we help truck fleets access federal funding to reduce emissions um, by using um, newer, cleaner, you know, cleaner diesel, if, if there's such a thing, right? <laughs> so, um, 
And, um, and then we, we talk to residents, um, talk to them about resources, find out um, what is it they're needing, and also um, continue to give them information on how to connect with the city, because a lot of what's happening right now is uh, tied into planning, tied into uh, zoning and rezoning, um, and some of the ordinances that we, we see coming down the pike, thankfully, to our very active um, current city council uh, member. Um, and uh, so, yeah, so we do a lot of talking to residents. Um, I know you asked about an origin story, but I don't, I think, uh, I think that's enough, right? So thank Well, you. I'll come back, Raquel. I love, <laughs> love, love uh, listening to you. I want to complete the intros, and then I think the next part is we'll actually talk about origin story for sure. Is that, is that okay? Keep going? All right. Natalie um, Sampson from U of M Dearborn, could I pull you in for an intro? Sure, thank you, thank you for having me. Um, I will say when Theodis reached out and I saw who the other speakers were, I said, you sure you want me? Um, I work with many of these folks, um, but I just am, I'm just so um, honored and, and respect everybody on this panel. So thanks for, for organizing and having this. I am um, on faculty at University of Michigan Dearborn. So just down the street from, from Detroit, but um, serve a lot of students who come from Detroit and Melvindale and Dearborn and Downriver um, who are working and living in Detroit as well. And um, spend a lot of my time working with community-based organizations to try to weasel health into conversations about planning and infrastructure conversations that are very timely right now, um, whether that be waste infrastructure, water infrastructure, transportation infrastructure, um, and really um, been working a lot with young people these days and trying to um, demystify, if you will, the, the environmental health science and environmental health policy process that we all can be part of that is really um, overly complicated sometimes, I think. So that's kind of my mission in life. And I'm just, again, honored to be here today. So thank you. Thank you, Natalie. And last but not least for our panel, uh, Faye Fullen from the Greening of Detroit. Hi, everyone. <clears throat> Excuse me. Um, uh, my name is Faye Fullen. I'm the Director of Green Infrastructure at the Greening of Detroit, um, which started in 1989 as a volunteer-led tree planting organization. Um, today, we really focus on um, two parts of our organization. One is uh, community forestry, where we're rebuilding the tree, city's tree canopy, as well as workforce development, providing opportunities for um, adult and youth to participate in, in that work. Um, very excited to be uh, with such an esteemed panel today. <laughs> Um, I guess a little bit about myself. I'm first generation Chinese American and I was born in Northwest Detroit. Um, I've always been really keen about nature, um, but I really didn't get any exposure until um, college, actually through friends and peers, um, being the first of my family to go straight to university after high school. So um, I have a really strong interest in sustainable development and that kind of brought me in a lot of different places that um, allowed me to, to be where I am today. Um, our big focus with Green in Detroit is um, rebuilding um, the city's canopy and distributing those resources in, a, in a, as equitable way as possible. Um, and so I look forward to hearing from everyone and sharing what I can about um, the work that we do. Awesome, so audience, you can hear this is an amazing panel and all of us I think feel a humbled in equal measure to, to be with each other today. So um, hats off to Fiori's and the University of Michigan team for um, thinking this up and pulling it together. And I'm really honored to be your moderator. Um, so as you heard, uh, we wanna talk a little bit about origin story. I can tell you um, as a moderator, uh, I know mine really stems from sort of accidentally being at a dinner in uh, Dearborn when I was 20 nothing years old and hearing Bunyan Bryant give a lecture, a keynote speech and um, understanding that where I grew up in Oakland County, although my family came to Detroit from Ireland, there was no magical wall at eight mile that stopped, you know, pollution and, and the like. Um, and anyway, I heard Bunny and Brian speak and I knew at that moment I needed to go to grad school. So off I went um, to study environmental justice at the University of Michigan, which frankly launched my career. Um, and so this is really special for me to come back and be among some of the leaders and some of the organizations that I worked with when I was 20 nothing years old. Um, and see how the organizations have changed over time. And I hope we spend a little bit of time going through that as well. But I'd really like to hear if, uh, if you can call your origin story or some people call it their epiphany, their, their, their awakening to the environment. 
Um, and I don't have an order to call you around in, but I'm going to call on Raquel because I know that um, it's on the tip of her tongue. So let me start with Raquel. Um, so my origin story or how I ended up right where I am right now today is um, a leap of faith that I took in 2011, 2012, when I left a job I loved um, at an, um, a local uh, institution of higher education here in Detroit. And, um, you know, I wasn't doing the things I wanted to do. I wasn't able to reach the community. I wasn't part of my community um working long hours and i i uh, just remember uh you know people in my community asking questions like uh what would your grandparents say you know what would your mom say if if you told her you're not happy and you know what what would, what is the advice and so i remember just thinking i need to go and I ended up um, becoming an organizer for a presidential campaign, Spanish speaker here in Southwest Detroit um, at that time in 2012, um, and knocking on doors and talking to residents. And there were so many questions. Um, is my house going to be sold? You know, I'm, I'm, I think it's, my house is in foreclosure or um, you know, just domestic violence resources, so many things. Um, and, um, and then also at that moment, um, having a young child uh, with lots of lead in our neighborhood and emissions and trucks, um, 10,000 trucks crossing the Ambassador Bridge daily. And I remember just feeling this crunching feeling in my chest thinking, you know, I've got to be part of a solution somewhere, somehow, um, because all of these things that are happening are, are hurting um, people. And so, I just uh, started talking to people, um, talking to people, you know, becoming involved, volunteering, and um, I ended on the, I ended up on the board at Southwest Detroit Environmental Vision, um, and then transitioned into um, the ED. And, and if you would have asked me in 2012, I just wouldn't have told you that you know leaving a job that was hurting me that I had to leave um, would lead me to um, a place where I'm so grateful and so happy and. Um, uh, and I love the fight, right? I love, <laughs> I love a good fight with a bad guy. So that's my origin story. Thank you, Raquel. I I'm going to bring anyone in from the panel who wants to to come in, um, unless you wish, wish me to popcorn it. I'm going to see who comes off mute first. Me. <laughs> Hello again. I I um I'm kind of new to this. Maybe a little bit like Raquel. You know, I was um, a state of Michigan retiree. And I was looking for something fun to do. And I got an email from Sierra Club. I don't remember what, you know, I think it was a rain barrel workshop. I thought, oh, that sounds interesting. But I went and I learned about, um, well, let me say this. I, I grew up spending summers with my grandparents in Canada, fishing in Rondo Bay, which is part of Lake Erie. It's my favorite thing to do. I love to fish and I love being by the water. And I heard at the Sierra Club workshop that Lake Erie was plagued by harmful algal blooms that were choking the life out of Lake Erie, creating dead zones and this nasty green scum. And I thought, oh no, <laughs> not in my fishing hole. So um, I, got, I got involved, you know, it was really very personal. Uh, we still have property there, our family does. And so, you know, it was like, I don't want that in our, uh, you know, near near us or by us. And so I, I, that was my epiphany. You know, I have to get involved. I have to do something. And uh, eight years later, <laughs> started as a volunteer. And now I'm an employee. Um, and people ask, when am I going to retire? I'm like, when all of our waters are totally clean. So maybe tomorrow. <laughs> Fingers crossed. Thank you. You're welcome. Thanks, Irma. Natalie, we appreciate our faith. You guys want to come in at all? Share some origin stories? Yeah, I'll pop in. Um, my story is somewhat similar to Raquel's in that I was um, in a position um, with a government entity. And I um, found myself really um, advocating for, for lack of a better word, false solutions to, to problems. And it started to feel icky. Uh, and so I, I just left. I, I didn't have a plan. I just knew that this didn't, 
suit me. This didn't feel right as a public health social worker to be perpetuating or supporting or you know, reporting out um, on things that I knew were not uh, the type of change that the community needed in order for the community health to be better. And so I left, um, I saw the position with DWEJ and I remembered DWJ from when I was in high school and they used to do toxic tours. And I had this warm and fuzzy feeling about DWEJ and it had like this special spot in my heart. Um, and I thought I'm gonna go for this. This seems to be the right time. This seems to be the right place. And I seem to be the right person. And so four months ago, I started as executive director um, with DWJ, but it made sense in the work that I had done previously. Um, my early career was research project management with community-based participatory research projects. And so the idea of partnering with the community, elevating community voices was not a foreign idea. And so it really dovetailed quite well with the work that I had done previously and what really spoke to me in terms of the importance of community-led solutions. And so that's what led me to DWJ and sort of kept me in this environmental justice space or environmental health space. I'm so glad that you made that jump. Um, Natalie or Faye? Sure, I'll jump in. I can't see Faye, so I don't know if she was in meeting. Um, I love I love hearing these stories, right? We're always in these meetings together and we don't know always all of all of this. And so Irma, I would have thought that you had been working on stormwater issues for decades because of your expertise. So um, you you caught up quickly. Um, you know, I am a Michigander by by uh, my whole life. And, you know, that comes with being part of the motor city culture. Um, and so, you know, my origin story is partly, you know, my family mostly benefited from that industry, but, you know, I'm now watching my father, who's not very old, deal with a lot of environmental health consequences. You know, he's got pulmonary fibrosis and cancer. And, you know, that's always made me question the the people and profits um, issue that we have, right? And, and I think that that really intrigued me. And I thought, you know, I'm not going down this industrial path. And, and so, you know, when I was a 20, 20 nothing like you, Harry, I um, had the opportunity to work in Southwest Detroit with a grassroots watchdog org that was looking at the Ambassador Bridge and nameless, we won't say who privately owned that, but, um, and they wanted me to just kind of like research the health effects of this, right? 20 some years ago. And now there's, you know, thousands and thousands of papers on, on those health implications. But I, it really opened my eyes to how research could be done in an equitable way if driven by community organizers. And so um, that really kind of has shaped my career and the work I do today. Um, and I feel really fortunate for that. So, oh, name has been said in the chat. <laughs> Thank you, Natalie. And Faye to you. All right, I'll, I'll round out the, the group. Um, as I mentioned, I'm first generation Chinese American and um, my this is probably more for folk, uh, for everyone, but especially for young people um, that um, I a, a lot of my journey has been honed by my by all of our experiences. Right. But um, uh, growing up as a child of immigrants, we we actually were in the Chinese restaurant business, actually, in on the east side of Detroit. My, the restaurant is still there, not owned by us. Um, but I really wasn't exposed to the outdoors, right, until much older in life. Um, but I was always um, keenly interested in nature, and I was exposed to it in what little ways. Mostly I was in the restaurant working or doing homework. Um, but it really was the opportunity to go to University of Michigan um, that really kind of exposed me to any opportunity. Um, I started in the, as a Bachelor of Fine Arts um, and kind of realized that I, as much as I loved communicating visually, that was kind of my, my skill, um, I really wanted to be able to use this tool for something functional. Um, and um, as a result, I, I started saying more industrial design, uh, the human focused design, which eventually brought me um, to, uh, to be a small business advisor in the Peace Corps in the republics of um, Guinea and, uh, and Mali, West Africa. And there, I guess this is the epiphany moment, um, uh, folks, even if they were in the city, always went back home to the village and, and they were very still tied to the land in some, in some way. 
And being, it was actually in the capital of Mali and Bamako, you could see some simple activity. Someone was uh, growing, a, actually it was a tree nursery and on the banks of the Niger River. And in that part of the world, they suffer from desertification. Basically they're losing their topsoil and it's the encroaching desert. But you can see that someone doing a small business um, was still providing um, environmental benefits because there was green space that was created around this river. Um, you had office workers that could look down on this green space. So there was aesthetics, there was economics, um, and there was an environmental benefit both there and then as those trees were planted out. And so that really told me that doing something good for the environment could have a benefit for much more. Um, and as a result, um, I came back to the US really interested in learning more about the environment. And so I pursued a degree in landscape architecture, uh, specifically at the University of Michigan, again, because one of their huge focus there, as opposed to being more theoretical design, but also because I was from Detroit and Detroit has always been like the city for me um, growing up. So um, I was always interested in sustainable development. And so just kind of gradually, I just found my way um, to the greening of Detroit. Um, but I never knew I was going to be in this spot. Um, I do have a tendency to be, to fill a vacuum when there is no leadership. <laughs> um, and not saying that about organization, but just in general, like there's, there, um, so as a young person, if you don't know where you're going, go somewhere and learn something and just keep building on that experience. Because I think that, you know, that was a 20 year experience <laughs> for me at this point. And I, I'm just so pleased that, you know, that I have the privilege to, to do this work. Thank you, Faye. So you're saying there's no perfect roadmap for how we all got to our positions. And that is my favorite question from young people. Um, when I used to work at the White House, um, they wanted to know the roadmap and the boxes to check. And I just laughed. I said, if only I had that, I definitely didn't. You guys all made me think about something even further back and it's kind of an interesting juxtaposition. Um, I grew up in the suburbs of Detroit where I say this kind of tongue in cheek, nothing ever happened and there was no bad stuff, right? Um, it was just um, the suburbs of Detroit. And so I found my way into the environment by reading a book by Rachel Carson, Silent Spring. And you know, she had passed 10 years before I was born, but that book had such an impact on me. And so if I impart with it, the panelists here, if you haven't written your book, I can tell you just so far in these 20 or so minutes we've been on, you've really inspired me. And I hope you know that your being out there and being who you are in your community um, is so important for, for young ladies um, to see you. So by the way, bravo to Fiotis for get, having an all-female um, panel. So that's rare these days. Well, let's, let's dig in a little bit, shall we? Um, you guys all work for really outstanding organizations doing amazing things, but the organizations have changed over time. Lapricia mentioned DWEJ from, from high school. I remember them from my early days in the executive order um, that we're working on for EJ. And um, it was a different organization. So if you guys wanna come in on your, on your own here and just talk about the organization, uh, how it's changed over time. Um, I think that's important because people kind of get their narrative on a, a group stuck. And it's not really like that, right? It's a little bit more fluid. So Lapricia, maybe you, let me send it over to you since you have some history with DWJ. Sure, 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 no problem. So I mentioned, of course, my my early memories of um, DWJ was, you know, the toxic doors, and I also recall that sort of the buzz in the community was that there was something going on, if there was a weird smell, um, if the sky looked strange, if right, you you call DWJ and they would help you activate. Um, and so that is, again, the roots were very grassroots. They were unapologetically Afrocentric as well. If you look at some of the old pictures, you'll see the kente cloth and you'll see, you know, some of those symbols um, there as well. Um, and there definitely was a move to, let me also say that the, you know, the thought of environmental justice was a little newer, fresher. There were less folks in that space. Um, and so there has been transitions and recreation of the organization, and it definitely morphed into something a little more grass tops. Um, and I was asked to come into this position, into this role, to get back to its roots and to look back at those original EJ principles that came out of the People of Color Summit, right? Um, and to really get back to 
the community and looking at community-led solutions and making sure that community voices are being elevated and that the agenda for DWEJ is, reflects the agenda of the community. And so that's been sort of the like ebbs and flows. And we're, we're back to, um, we're getting back to that, that grassroots piece. And um, we, we need to expand the board. We need to, <laughs> we need to have different type of representation. I'm just being very transparent. I feel like I'm here with 30 friends, right? Um, <laughs> so so um, that, that really was my charge coming in four months ago to do just that. Um, Lucretia, so, you're getting a great question from the chat. What is yes, DWEJ? I'm sorry. Detroiters working for environmental justice is what DWEJ is. And it was the first environmental justice organization in the state of Michigan. Great. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to popcorn it over to, to Faye because I think she also works for an organization that's definitely changed over time. Can you comment on that, Faye? Sure. Um, I've been the director of um, the Green Infrastructure Department since I think fall of 2017, <clears throat> but I've been with the organization on and off between 2010 as an intern, 2012, and then recruited back in 2015 um, as a um, business development manager. And what that really meant to me was project development. Um, so two parts. Um, for project development is really kind of understanding a beginning and an end of a project so that um, we can help uh, develop tree planting projects. So um, trying to might be going back and forth, but two things happened. So we restructured in, in about like early 2017. Um, prior to that, we had become, you know, we were started as a volunteer led tree planting organization in 1999, like five, 10 people. Um, and then slowly it just became bigger and bigger. And so we ended up um, planting thousands and thousands of trees a year. Um, and we just got big. We got really big. We were doing a lot of things. Um, we had three departments at the time. Um, and we just had to, we had to stop, put a stop on everything and, and restructure. So um, in the rebuilding of our organization, especially the part around community forestry, is taking a look at, um, you know, how we're doing things and why. Um, so like I said, my big focus is making sure that we can get those tree resources to Detroit because they're limited, like just they're just limited or finite, but bringing as much as we can to Detroit, attracting it, and then we do it through collaboration. So we work directly with Detroit residents. Um, we recognize residents volunteering in their own community, um, but we also recruit external volunteers. So there's, um, there's a space for everyone in this, in this <coughs> uh, mission free force uh, the city. Um, but we also recognize that residents um, are also having uh, low income and communities of color had to bear the burden of this investment around trees. And so we're not also asking them like, here's some trees, now plant it yourself. Um, I would hate that if someone came to my neighborhood and said, took up my Saturday to do that. <clears throat> and I do this for a living. So, um, but as far as the Green in Detroit goes, um, we are still playing quite a few trees um, today, but we have, when we talk about project development, it's, you know, we did a tree planting today. We started that work last year, uh, understanding what the, the community's interests were, and then providing that technical support to say, okay, well, you're looking at species, we're looking at the site, um, maybe these can't grow, we need it to be a certain height. Um, and so we bring that, but we're really tailoring all of that work based on the community partner, um, even the messaging, if they're reaching out to their friends and neighbors um, so that um, we're not leading it because at, we're planting, helping and support to plant the trees, but it's the community that are the stewards of these trees. We do provide um, support in irrigation and maintenance, but at the end of the day, it's um, a community project. And so we're very much community focused, but we're not as grassroots as some of the other organizations on the panel. And just being honest about that too, is I think it's yeah. important. Well, it's, it's good to know. I think part of the value of this panel is showing the diversity of different groups and uh, ways that folks who have joined us today can participate. Um, so let me let me look at Natalie, Irma, Raquel, see if you all want to come in on, on the question of the organization change over time, or if you want to um, bring any of the folks from the, the call in, go ahead. Yeah, I, I would, uh, because Sierra Club is really you know, it's this na largest national grassroots organization in the country, uh, 3.5 million members and supporters. 
And when you think of Sierra Club, probably you're, you'll think of national parks, protecting wild places, protecting wildlife. Um, for years, its history has been, well, a little racist, but also mostly um, focused on the environment, specifically just uh, the out of doors and enjoying and protecting the out of doors. But uh, over the last five to 10 years, I think we've really uh, changed our focus, understanding that uh, pollution is not just uh, about the environment, that it's also about people. And the people who are bearing the biggest brunt of that pollution are people of color, indigenous people, um, people who have not traditionally been members of the Sierra Club and or thought of within the, the, the Sierra Club sphere. So we're changing significantly to understand that and to be more inclusive, to understand environmental injustices and how we can play a part um, in, in creating a better world for everybody. Raquel, I think you're coming in too on that question. We definitely, um, we're evolving at like every organization here. Um, we began in 1991-92 as a project of Southwest Detroit Business um, Association. And, um, you know, I think at that point it was uh, to have a conversation between residents and all of the businesses that were here. So we definitely had a business uh, focus on, you know, uh, how to have a conversation with them. Um, you know, make asks. Um, I think at that time, um, you know, we needed jobs in the neighborhood and there was a lot of, um, you know, dumping and, um, you know, different needs that, that, that residents had. Um, and while we, we also at that time, I think we're doing brownfield projects. Um, and so, um, you know, already, if you think about that, already this, this land around us was already you know, very polluted um, that needed to get cleaned up in this in this area. Um, and now, I mean, there's been a lot between then and now, and um, we definitely feel uh, we're asking, making bigger asks of companies. Um, we are now uh, rebooting our healthy, <laughs> sorry, <laughs> dogs, <laughs> um, healthy business um, initiative where we are going to, um, there's a renewed interest, you know, um, with, you know, climate um, change. It's now, you know, everybody's talking about it every day. And I, I feel like, you know, even five years ago, three years ago, it was just not at the forefront. So now we're going back to businesses to make sure if there's any sort of sustainability or green um, initiative that they want to do, we can connect them to resources. Um, and we're also doing a lot more work um, with the city of Detroit and ordinances that impact um, at a larger scale, um, you know, uh, how we do planning in the city of Detroit, how we, um, how companies are allowed to do business in Detroit. Um, and I appreciate what Faye said about, um, you know, not being as community rooted or, you know, I feel that one of the things um, that SDB is focused on right now is being really lateral um, and not having a hierarchy. So we internally, uh, when we think about environmental justice and having everyone has voice, um, everyone speaks and tells their own story. And sometimes even in progressive organizations, there's still power and hierarchy. Um, and so we're really looking to develop everyone's voice, everyone's leadership. Uh, we're an all-female team um, uh, by accident, not, not on purpose, but um, we're really investigating how, um, what does it mean to be, to come to an organization and to really, you know, have access to change, ha have access to how it's formed and how it's shaped. Um, and, you know, uh, we also have lots of conversations about our values and how we live our values every day. And one of them is non-compete. If an organization does something really well, we're not gonna write a grant for that. We're gonna partner with our partner, our sister organizations. Um, we don't wanna mission creep and get into other people's spaces. Um, we want to be respectful. And that's why I think it was so powerful to start with a land acknowledgement. We need to really talk about power, uh, cultural humility, and even personal humility in an organization so that we um, can be welcoming and uh, can build trust. Um, and you know, 
sometimes in progressive organizations, um, there's still a lot of power and a lot of um, and disempowerment. And so that's probably the way that we are evolving even most recently. Yeah, thanks. Amazing. Um, Cara, who's on my team, dropped into the chat the links to all of the organizations um, that are on the panel today. Just would, I, I've been operating since eighth grade under the assume nothing rule. So if you all want to go to the chat and, and peruse those as we continue through the, the time. And I'm noting the time, we are spending a lot of time on some fun topics, but I want to get into one of the key elements of the, um, the way the panel was advertised. It was really about challenges and opportunities in Detroit. And since these are all Detroit facing organizations, um, I thought we'd go through and talk about some of them uh, that I know some of us are feeling in really real meaningful ways right now. Maybe kind of what you see as uh, biggest challenge, biggest opportunity for Detroit. And I will note that when Fiotis put the panel out, he talked about Pure Michigan and how we advertise to the world about this great state and what is our flagship city and how's it looking and how's it faring these days. So um, may I look to the panel for someone to come in on, on biggest challenges, big opportunities from your perspective? Well, I can start. Um... You know, as a person who's, you know, focuses on water quality, um, well, uh, water quality as well as water access, access to water. But um, the, one of the largest challenges certainly is uh, climate change, which is creating these more intense storms. These storms are creating this, the, the massive flooding that we're seeing, but also combined sewer overflows. And that's because our combined sewer system is overwhelmed when we have the big storms and it results in sewage, partially treated sewage, sometimes raw sewage, flowing into both the Detroit and the Rouge rivers. And, uh, you know, we are fortunate to be here in the Great Lakes Basin, 20% of the world's fresh surface water, 85% of the fresh surface water in, the, in North America. And so it's an opportunity it's a, it's a blessing, it's an obligation. I feel that we have to protect this resource. You know, water is life, you know, it drives everything. And so we can't squander it. We shouldn't be squandering it. And, and so, uh, you know, the threat, any threat to water quality uh, is significant and needs to be addressed. And uh, what we're seeing now happening in uh, the federal government with discussions on infrastructure funding that is part of the solution. That's one of the big opportunities that will be coming in some form. We will see more funding for infrastructure, including stormwater and wastewater. And so what we have to do is be prepared. We have to, um, I know that locally we have the Great Lakes Water Authority, the Detroit Water and Sewage Department, uh, both have capital improvement plans, wastewater master plans uh, that will provide a roadmap to what needs to be done. Um, it'll take some years, but certainly it's a big threat, but also a big opportunity with these dollars coming. Okay. Natalie, I, I left you out of that last question. You want to come in and talk about challenges and opportunities from your perspective? Sure, sure. No, no worries. I, we can, that could be a whole other panel discussion about the role. Um, the challenges and opportunities of, of universities in this mix. But um, yeah, I mean, I think Irma, obviously everything she said is spot on. You know, we were in a, uh, some of us were in a meeting yesterday and, and many of you know Monica Lewis Patrick and she really was bringing us back to, you know, our job in this moment is to really counter decades of disinvestment and, and austerity measures and how, you know, that has led to a lot of narratives about Detroit. And I think that's led to a lot of, um, inequities, obviously, when we look at energy burden, water shutoffs, right, all of these things that um, are perpetuated by climate change. And I think the, the challenge of what Irma's talking about, you know, making sure those infrastructure dollars are going to the right places and to, you know, community owned and managed solar power from solidarity or, you know, um, the solutions that are on the ground, I think, is, is, is a really big challenge that we have to make sure that the universities aren't scooping up all those dollars or you know other um, municipalities that or, or even other parts of the city that that um aren't the most vulnerable and so i think that's a big challenge but i also don't want to lose sight of the fact that a lot of our environmental protections also 
you know, aren't addressing the historic harms. And so we have, yes, this build back better and these, mon these money's coming in, but let's also make sure that we're enforcing and improving those existing policies, right? So we're still in non-attainment for sulfur dioxide and ozone. And so I think that um, making sure that we don't lose track of that which is a big challenge to keep all of this on our on our plates. And so, you know, like Irma said, I think for me, the opportunity, you know, I'm paying attention to all of these organizations and the Michigan Environmental Justice Coalition, and they are tracking those windows of opportunity when, you know, these conversations and these funding opportunities are happening. So I'm following, you know, those leads on when to comment and when to weigh in, but um, it is an interesting time to be working on these issues for sure. Thank you, Natalie. I'm looking to see Raquel, Lapresha. So this is a good time to ask that question that we were talking about. Um, how many, how many people have um, attended a city council meeting? Maybe you can put it in the chat. Is anybody, any of our guests? Yeah, if you use um, the raise hand feature too, that works. Yeah, I think so. Um, we just passed in Detroit the water protection um, ordinance. It's, we call it a lot of different things. The Eric, um, thank you, Eric. Um, the the Detroit River uh, protection, you know. And so, um, I think the the opportunity um, is really great um, for residents to become really curious about um, where they live, um, the micro community that they live in. Um, you know, what is the thing that's going to affect my neighborhood or District 6 or wherever, wherever they live and like really like attend these meetings, come to the planning meetings. Um, you know, we back to the origin story, you know, uh, you're not born knowing these things. It's a muscle that you that you learn to use and practice. Um, and uh, I used to think that folks, you know, were just like super trained and like super courageous to go to these meetings. Um, and it's not, that's not how it works. You know, we, we have a lot of, um, a lot of opportunity, but we need to make that opportunity together. Um, and that means, for example, um, even let's just go to the water protection ordinance. That's jobs, right? Like, so a lot of businesses are, are upset because they have to put up, you know, additional boundaries to protect the water, but somebody has got to put them up. Um, there's going to have to be folks um, that come and, and review if they're doing what they're supposed to be doing. Um, and the outcome, you know, it's probably a business write off. There's probably grants that the state can um, put in place to help support, you know, what they have to do. And um, there's a lot of opportunity in every potential ordinance that is designed to protect um, our assets are our, our, what we need. Um, and I, I think that the, the, big, um, the big opportunity, the big challenge is that I'm just gonna echo um, what Natalie said, you know, there's a lot of sustainability coming down the pike. Everybody's talking about it. That's really great. Um, there's a lot of potential uh, newness um, for businesses, for houses, every, you know, for, for schools. Uh, I just keep seeing the EPA sending all these different links to potential opportunities. Um, and, you know, but we also have to keep in mind that, that um, sustainability and environmental justice, um, they, they should go hand in hand, but they're, they're very separate and different. You know, um, we're talking about communities that haven't had, um, you know, access to clean air and um, uh, have not been able to shape the communities that they live in. Um, you know, they, they have asked for businesses to not get a permit to develop or expand. Um, and so we need everyone. Um, to, to be curious, to join, to, to reach out to an organization and say, how do I get involved? Um, because there's a lot of potential great work, and great um, bonding together and um, growing together and building community um, in, in this practice. And so, um, uh, yeah, I mean, there's a lot of really fantastic work coming down the pike, at least four or five truck routes, anti-idling, um, there's uh, just a, a lot of beautiful potential protections coming down the pike. Thank you, Raquel. So we, the question, you know, the reason I think we took the temperature of the audience is just to kind of check in on engagement because all of everybody on this panel came in at some different point, some experience, something changed um, and want to encourage everyone to, to have their own experience and find their way to engage. And these are wonderful organizations doing really important work. 
But what do you say, panel, about the organizations and entities that aren't Detroit organizations that want to do good work here um, from elsewhere that are coming in? I would love to go around and just get your, your take or your advice um, for those organizations, institutions um, that want to come and do good things here. Um, what recommendations might you have there? Um, this is Faye from Greening of Detroit. So we actually see this quite a bit because we are so willing to partner with outside organizations. Um, part of it is actually really making sure that outside organizations, they, they know what their intentions are, but also to really reach out to organizations like ours or other institutions to kind of gain the temperature and kind of understand what is actually the challenge. Um, that they're, I mean, they probably come with a specific intent. So kind of talking to as many people and organizations as possible before they kind of create a plan of what they're doing and why in the city. I think it's really important. Um, there's a lot of challenges here in Detroit that are quite different um, than other parts of, of the Southeast Michigan or the state. Um, but there's some overlapping similarities. I think the important part is really finding folks and that are interested in sharing that information but also just being observant and understanding their own intentions, but also um, being able to listen to what the actual challenges that they might be able to help support. Other panelists? I think this is, I, I've seen this in recent days and recent weeks of different uh, news articles of organizations. Irma? Uh, so I, I really like the concept of coalitions. And so as with the Healing Our Waters Great Lakes Coalition, it's 160 organizations, about 50 of them are in Michigan. And I think there's real strength when you have a group of people who have um, uh, similar priorities or shared values and goals to work on a problem. And I, I think we're hyper-focused on Eight Mile Road. Understand that. I am a lifelong Detroit. I've lived here my entire life. I get it. But I also understand that there are resources and expertise all over the place. And, the, and so for me is when you come to Detroit, one, I, I'd like to see some respect, to be respectful of the city, of the people who live here, um, some deference to the lived experience of the people that, that are here, uh, some collaboration, you know, working, truly working together. Um, you know, not taking advantage, not using and abusing or taking and leaving. Uh, so there's a way to do it. And if, if it's done properly, um, it's, I think it's a strength um, and will be beneficial. That makes total sense. Um, I'm doing a quick time check. We've got about five minutes on the panel and then we did want to open it up to anyone uh, through the Q&A in the chat. I'll moderate through the questions if you guys want to, in the audience want to come in with your questions and we'll get those going. But with the time on the clock left, could I ask um, us to popcorn around with this question? What makes the city resilient? I'm not going to say anything else except for that. So I'll give you a pause. Then I'm going to go to Lapricia because she's been on mute for too long. Before I answer that one, if I can just say one thing about the last question, um, and that is, as others want to join with Detroit organizations or Detroiters to be supportive, to recognize that is of mutual benefit. So it is a learning process. You are bringing resources and gaining resources when you come. If that's not the intent, then it may not be a good fit. So just recognizing that it is mutually beneficial. Okay. Now, what was the question? I'm sorry. I love that. I'm writing this all down. Um, actually, that was my lived experience, Lucretia, when I was on the um, task force for Detroit, for the federal government. And I went back and I said, Detroit made us smarter. Yeah. And I learned a lot. Um, I appreciate that comment. So the, your question right now, and this is going to come to everybody on the panel as we, as we wind down, is what makes a city resilient? Goodness. I mean, isn't Detroit the definition of resilient? Um, That's a pretty good answer right there. Yeah, like, the, right? So <laughs> um, being able to 
recover, replenish, restore, rejuvenate, re-energize, um, right? And if that's not Detroit, I don't know what Detroit is. So we have all these ebbs and flows and we've had emergency managers and we've had bankruptcies and we've had industry leave and industry come back and, and uh, leadership, you know, that's questionable. Um, <laughs> on lots of different levels. We've had disinvestment, we've had, and we are the same thing that made us great um, with, with Motown and made us great with the big three and are the same things that make us great now. It's that creativity and it's that grit um, and it's that can-do attitude and it's us being able to see um, opportunity and potential in things. And I'm gonna give you an example of my Detroiter babies, um, my children, I used to let them, when we would drive around, I would let them tell me, turn right, turn left, et cetera. And we were in an area in Detroit that had what I consider vacant lots. And we were riding down the street and my children said, oh, look at that field of flowers, right? And that's sort of what uh, connects us to this work and keeps us going, that we see a field of flowers. Right, we see an empty lot and we say we could do a windmill park there. Um, right, uh, we see a liquor store and we say we could get them to put fresh fruits and vegetables next to the snacks up front. Um, uh, right, and so Detroit is to me the definition of resilience. Now, maybe you meant climate resiliency, I'm not sure, so maybe I didn't answer the question. <laughs> it was so a beautiful response. I mean. I think that was the name of our panel, but I think the beautiful response. But let's add on climate, Lapricia. Climate, <laughs> since we've got you on right now. What do you think okay. it's gonna take to make a city like Detroit resilient to climate change? Oh, goodness. So it, it, again, it, it's gonna be those community-led solutions. It's going to be um, us reaching into government and government reaching back into us. And, and what Raquel talked about, um, what everyone I think talked about in terms of engagement, a lot of environmental justice work is reactive, but there are also opportunities for us all to be involved at the planning level and to make sure that they're community-led solutions. Thank you so much. Um... I'm going to go over to Raquel with just piggybacking off of what you said. Um, when you say reach into government and reach back out, who is government? And so Raquel, I'm going to let you take that one and ask that same question. What makes Detroit resilient to climate change? So we see that Detroit um, is very responsive. Um, we're, you know, um, we've gone through a lot. There was a time when they weren't picking up the trash. There was a time, you know, when, you know, just so many different things that have occurred and, um, you know, and people are really hardy and they're super connected to each other and they're quick learners. And I, what we have been finding is that um, we've got a project now where we're trying to do energy efficiency conversations. And um, not only does it create healthier air inside your home, but you're lessening the, the pull on the grid, which in turn produces right like cleaner air. Um, and people want to, to help and people want to help and they want to be part of the conversation and they want to do what they can inside their homes. Um, and I think that if we ask, we, they'll do it. And if we tell them and, 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 and have them not tell them and dictate, but to invite them to the conversation and give information, people are ready. People are ready to join. People are ready to, um, to help be part of that impact. And I, I want to respond to the previous question, which was the outside, outside organizations. Um, and just, you know, uh, there is a lot of great intent, but if we're if we're not including people and in doing the work and the time that it takes to build relationships, it's institutional racism all over again. Um, we see parks that come up overnight, and some group of not, uh, volunteers come in. We don't know who they are, and they, you know, put in flowers and trees, and we don't know where they came from, and and we feel like it belongs to somebody else. And we did a project here. Um, it was um, participatory budgeting and everybody knew, everybody talked about the potential solutions, what they wanted, a basketball court, a soccer field. Um, and I think it takes time. It's like slow food. Like we need, people want to be included. And so I think that um, as, as the plans um, 
roll out that we need to do that work. And when an organization comes from the outside, even if they have the best intention, um, people uh, won't readily ex accept it or ad adopt or adapt it. So um, I think the face-to-face -face, um, interactions are what make uh, people resilient in Detroit. Thank you, Raquel. Writing down some of my favorite quotes here. And maybe I'll go over to Irma next, who is a big fan of collaboration. We heard, and from what I hear from Raquel, collaboration is a contact sport for those of you who are playing ath former athletes like myself. Yes. Um, so what makes Detroit, you know, I, I'm, all, I'm totally behind what Lucretia said. Detroit is the story of resilience. But I also think that, you know, when you're kind of quote unquote an outsider, haven't lived here, you kind of buy into what you read in the newspaper. <laughs> and you think Detroit's kind of this really sad, sappy place. But um, the reality is we have tremendous amount of assets and resources here. Um, uh, really kind of an extraordinary place that has had trouble, right? We, we have had trouble, you know, because of population loss. However, um, in terms of the assets that I'm speaking of, people, right? You have some really strong people, very self-reliant and resilient. Um, we have land, uh, we have neighborhoods, an industrial legacy. We're still known as Motor City, the city that put the world on wheels, uh, our arts and culture scene. We have the largest, or at least a few years ago, the largest um, theater district outside of New York. Here in Detroit, there are so many theaters and places performing to go for performances and arts and culture. We have the, um, you know, some really beautiful neighborhoods and architecture. Um, it, people with great ideas. You know, you, you can come here with nothing and do lots of things. You know, it's just kind of like the sky is the limit if you can imagine and if you believe in the opportunity and believe in what it is you want to do. Uh, I think people are very kind, uh, very helpful. Um, you know, there is the mistrust, you know, a lot of folks have been burned and have felt that, but you know, the thing is we don't give up. You know, we don't give in to that. We might be a little, stand, you know, you've got to prove yourself, but we're still here and we're still willing to pitch in and help and be part of a solution. So I, mean, I love, this is my city and I love it. I, I went to, lived in Cleveland for undergraduate, Kansas City for graduate school. And each time, never wanted to stay, always wanted to come back to Detroit. You know, not just because it's home. My family's not here. You know, they left, but I love this city. And, and it's that kind of attitude and that spirit that you find throughout the city. That's really beautiful. And I can feel that. That's very heartfelt, Irma. Thank you. Yeah. Um, Natalie, what makes a city resilient to climate change? I don't have much to add. I think all of these women have, have gotten to it, but um, you know, I will just say this. I was reading an article yesterday, today about how COVID has really um, broken down what was left of some of our social ties. And, you know, I think a lot of times with climate change, when we're thinking about a lot of these extreme events, it's it's coming back to um, social support in our communities and our neighborhoods and our families and these organizations that we trust. And so I just, um, I think Raquel threw it in the chat, but the mutual aid and the work that I've, you know, over this last summer that we've seen people um, taking care of each other, it's just amazing. And it's not, you know, I think that when we think about the apocalypse and scarcity and competition, I don't feel like that's what plays out um, when we see our streets are flooding and people are really checking on each other. And so I feel like that care piece, that collective care piece um, is something I really value about Detroit. I see your head's nodding. And then Faye, let me um, close this question with you on what makes the city resilient to climate change? Um, I would definitely echo everyone's comments around the people um, Detroiters, residents themselves. Um, I think there's an earlier part of the question about resilience and what we, the challenges around resilience. Um, obviously our work um, at the Green Detroit is really tree focused and nature focused. Um, but I guess there's two things I, I definitely wanna share with everyone. Um, 
One is uh, our outdoor spaces in nature um, are a big part of our, our infrastructure. Um, obviously, re recognizing um, underground great infrastructure is, 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 has to be a big part of the solution, but that nature is a big part of it as well. Um, and um, equity and access to quality outdoor spaces is very important. And obviously, I think we can recognize that now in the pandemic. Um, and so, uh, you know, there's been more investments in certain play, uh, playgrounds and parks throughout the city. And I, I hope that that's going to continue at the same rate in, in all neighborhoods. Um, because uh, a community that can can be outside with each other is going to be uh, more healthy. <laughs> um, and um, so that's one aspect. And then um, the green, if like, Climate change is is, is such a is, is such a challenge. Um, we know about water quality, and we were talking about air, and then heat and urban heat island effect is is very real when we think about Detroiters who are um, I think thirty percent about a third of Detroiters do not have access to a car, um, uh, and so you know they're relying on foot and then public transportation for uh, their daily needs, and we know how hot it gets. So I just want to. I, I know we're trying to like, we're resilient, but there's also major challenges that we have to make sure that we address. And uh, trees are one way of doing it, but there's a lot more um, planning that needs to make sure that, you know, places are walkable and then amenities are within access um, access to where, where we live. So um, we're resilient, but we definitely, I, I love Raquel and uh, I'm sure what you're saying, Irma, like really about policy. That's not a focus of, of myself personally, but it's something where um, being curious is really going to be helpful in understanding how we can actually enact more change at that broad level. Awesome. Can I just pop in and say, I know I got it going off track. So I do want to... <laughs> So I do want to bring up something that Natalie and I and a group of others, Raquel too, um, I don't know if Irma, you're part of that, but we've been working on when we think about climate resiliency, how uh, we can better align uh, notifications and alerts to those in the city when there are emergencies and how we can make sure the systems that are in place work together better. So that's something we've been working on behind the scenes and are trying to come up with a strategy um, so that as there are issues that the community is aware. So that's definitely part of that resi climate resiliency of peace, making sure that there's preparation uh, in advance and then there's a way to activate. So. That's fabulous. Um, and I wanna know more about it. Um, well, I'm looking at the clock. We, we've got about 15 minutes left with each other. I have tons more questions I could ask this great panel, but I wanna take advantage of the fact that we had a nice turnout tonight um, and go to the audience questions. Um, but before I do that, I think one of the things that we, we met before this uh, panel tonight and talked about the different sort of menu of ways to participate with these amazing organizations. And again, they're in the, um, the chat, Kara Dietz put them in the chat if you wanna pull down there. Uh, websites, if you're not familiar with every organization, it's worth your time to peruse their website to find out how to get involved. But I, I chatted, or I noted some of these ways to participate, um, letter writing, door knocking, phone banking, protesting, there's lots of different ways to get involved. And I think what you've heard hopefully from these amazing women is they're all willing to meet you where you are in your journey um, to understand you know, the place that we all live. Um, so with that, let me look at the chat. I've got my team helping me out. Um, and I'm going to ask one of the audience questions. There's one about recycling. So I don't know if any of you all have um, thoughts on this, but it says Detroit doesn't have citywide recycling plan. And even where they do, is this really making a difference or is it recycling theater? Can um, I answer? Oh okay, my gosh. Go Detroit has had citywide curbside recycling for years, at least five. So yes, we do have it. In fact, it's expanded this year um, to not just residential, but also to multifamily uh, recycling and I think something else. So we do have recycling. We have yard waste that's picked up and um, so the leaves and that, and they're taken somewhere and then given to somebody for composting. Uh, we are pursuing some composting in the city, so food waste. Uh, we're trying to get a handle on that. And we being the Detroit City Council Green Task Force, uh, which has seven committees. I co-chair the water committee, but there's also organics and they're the one working on citywide composting. 
So I misunderstood the question earlier about resiliency. I went to like people in the city, but in terms of climate resiliency, yeah, we're doing a lot, including that the fact that we have recycling, but we also have a greenhouse gas ordinance, you know, so we're trying to get a handle on reducing our greenhouse gas ordinance, post-construction stormwater ordinance, where we're trying to make sure that any new development that comes to the city, if it's more than a half, um, I believe it's a half an acre disturbed either for development or redevelopment. They are required to manage stormwater on site. Um, and there, if you put in green infrastructure, if you're a business or a nonprofit, uh, you know you can get green credits uh, reduction off your um, uh, your drainage fee, which is like a stormwater utility. And we're lucky to have that. Quite honestly, most cities, you know, in Michigan are clamoring to get a stormwater utility. Um, we, we have a climate action plan with sustainability action agenda with like 60 uh, goals that have been established. The tree program through the city is called 10,000 Up. I, I've got a list of about 20 initiatives in the city um, to try to um, increase our resiliency to climate change. Um, all of the uh, Greenway work, the Joe Lewis Greenway, uh, that's that's just been started um, will help with that. Um, and some of our mobility initiatives, right? We've got bikes, more bike lanes. We have the scooters and MoGo and the city is electrifying some of its fleet. So it's a lot happening. It's not as, you know, we're not there yet, but, you know, there are things going on and we love, you know, really for anybody <laughs> to participate with the Detroit City Council Green Task Force we're always looking for people to help come with good ideas. That's great. And I'll, uh, I'll put the onus on Fiotis to get out the information to everyone who's joined tonight so that if you do wanna follow up, you at least have some, a good place to start. Um, let me go to another question from the audience. Um, is there an indigenous women's group in the area tapping into their wisdom of caring for earth is also important. I think Raquel, you might've touched on this, but I don't know if we talked about any specific groups. Um, there's a, a group of grandmothers that practice um, here and in Flint, um, and they are Mexicas. Um, they work with um, Mexican American, Latinas, um, and then there's also the American Indian Health Services, and they have a lot of different activities to connect to. Um, I do think it's really important to um, connect in a different way and, um, you know, to really uh, prioritize um, the older ways to connect to um, ancestral work and to to find out just to really learn um, because there's a different there's a different way um, I feel we've been conditioned to look at things and profit and you know uh, commercial and you know to buy things and so when you when you step away from that a little bit um, it, it just slows down your heart and your mind and it, you know, um, and I, I'll give you just a quick example. Um, we were talking about raccoons the other day and somebody was like, um, their pest kill them. And I'm, and I was like thinking, wow, we're so violent. They're so violent. And they were here before us, <laughs> they were here before us. And how are we not connected to the ecosystem? of Detroit, right? There used to be a lot of animals here before we moved in um, into the area and, and took over a lot of the land. And so um, we need to question what we know and what we think. That's one way to do it. Thanks, Raquel. Let's jump in too. I know we started by talking about Bunyan Bryant and um, to throw in the university, but there's a couple of amazing EJ leaders um, at the School for Environment and Sustainability, including Kyle White, who really, um, his work approaches this and at the national and local level, thinking about um, all of these issues from an indigenous perspective. So I encourage you to Google Kyle and, and read his work. Very good call. He's on the White House and Environmental Justice um, Council right now. So I'm, I was really thr thrilled to read about that. Um, great. And then I have another question. This actually came from a panelist. I won't disclose who, but here's the question. What are challenges and barriers to resident engagement? The interest is about the panel's thoughts on how equal access to nature's stewardship ties environmental justice, ties into environmental justice. Um, but we'd also like to put that one back out to the audience as well. So challenges and barriers to resident engagement. So for those of you joining us today, um, maybe it would be really good for us to hear 
uh, what might be holding you back or what has held you back? I think a lot of the, in, the current engagement has to do with planning. And so it's a check. <laughs> Sorry. It's a box that someone is checking to say they've engaged a group. Um, what I don't see um, is, for example, real public land um, that gets to get shaped by uh, a neighborhood. So a, a, a lot that gets to be shaped by meetings and by engagement to see what people really need rather than um, this is already going up or we're gonna sell this land um, and uh, did you know about it? And it's, it's sort of a just checking off um, rather than really asking what needs to come uh, to the neighborhood and how do we get that um, as, a, as a group. Um, and um, I think um, there's a lot of surveys, people are exhausted. Um, and then they, they, they give their information up and then um, people don't come back or they don't know where it went. And so it's, um, we need, that's why I believe in, in micro neighborhoods, um, you, you need folks to live where they work uh, because you're accountable and they know where you live and they can come ask you questions. Um, and when we have folks um, coming in from other areas, um, it's okay, but it needs to be done in a way that's like, Irma said, respectful and, and that um, prioritizes and elevates um, community voices. And sometimes that's messy and ambiguous, but it, it needs to be done that way so that people can sort out their feelings and ideas. Um, and so, you know, uh, yeah, I, I, we prefer, we, we hope that people live and experience what residents are experiencing um, so that when they write up a plan, they really, really understand, um, as Natalie said, when somebody in your family has cancer, uh, the different kind of planning that, that happens when you are trying to protect somebody's lungs or you have a cement factory down dicks, silica in cement is, is worse than uh, a lot of part particulate matter. And so we, we just need that proximity that, that um, and I will say that sometimes people say, we just don't have that talent here or that training, invest the time, it's worth it. And, and it's, we need that capacity in the neighborhood. It doesn't, it, the jobs don't always have to, you know, people come in here, do the work and then leave. Like that, it, it's, it hurts when we see that. Thank you for sharing that, Raquel. LaPricia? Yeah, I would just say the barriers that, and we're guilty of it as, as an organization. Um, and I think Raquel, you know, SDB does a, a much better job in terms of engaging residents um, by doing some of the door knocking, being right there, you know, on the ground level. And the digital divide gets in the way of, of a lot of this. So um, Raquel knows that there was a, a survey that went out recently um, that none of us knew about that has an impact on things that happen at the city level. And it was just on the website, you know, we found out the day before and tried to get the word out. Um, so that that gets in the way when there aren't, um, when there's not intention, intentionality around reaching the residents and making sure that happens in different languages and different modalities. and is getting to those that can actually reach into the community or that are part um, of those communities. So even with things that you know we're thinking about, I'm about to post a couple of positions and someone mentioned using you know, m a a website to do it. And I said, no, I have to get this to some of the community organizations so they can put it at the laundromat, right? On a piece of paper hanging somewhere so that people have access. So some of it is just that access to the information to know there's a city council meeting and this is happening and this is what will be talked about or this survey is going out. How, how then do you um, engage if, if you don't have internet or you know, aren't checking the websites constantly? That is really good information for some of our institutional friends to hear. Um, I had a, just as an anecdote to Lucretia's point, I had a friend that was asked to do a big task for um, the city. Um, and they said, oh, we'll just you know, put it on the website to the previous point. And my friend said, well, why don't we put a postcard? This is about small business engagement. What about the lady who makes the muffins for church? She's also a small business. How is she gonna find? She doesn't check the, your website. Um, 
And I'll tell you, my friend suggested that she would pay for the first batch of postcards to go out. And it was embarrassing to the leaders because they didn't think of that. Um, but sometimes we have to suggest things and, you know, I, I often tell things to my husband and then he thinks it's his idea. So it's a bit of reverse psychology, whatever works, right? Um, anyway, we're coming up on time. I want to give the time back to this amazing panel. I just want you to know I feel really blessed to have spent um, this special time with you today. But I'd like to give you each like a minute and a half to uh, share some closing remarks before we uh, call it an evening. So maybe I'll go in reverse order from how we started this evening and start with Faye to close us out. Uh, on the spot. Um... Uh, once again, thank you so much for inviting me in the panel, and I loved hearing from everyone here. Um, I don't know what we're supposed to say exactly, but I will share that if, if folks are interested in learning about trees or participating in a planting event, we do have our fall schedule up on our website, um, and as well as our community tree planting application, which is online, but we also have our uh, community outreach coordinator that is able to fill that out um, for you and with you, um, and that's really just starting a conversation around trees trees um, and how they can, you know, help support um, the needs of community members. Um, so I encourage you to check out our website and reach out by email um, and we can talk more about trees. Our big thing is really kind of taking this thing that sounds really technical and breaking it into small pieces that's really just easy to digest. So um, I recommend that for any anything that seems super technical and spending the time and talking with uh, each other and residents. Thanks. Thank you, Ferry. Natalie? Sure, yeah. I mentioned at the beginning that I um, spend a lot of time with, with younger folks these days working on environmental issues. So I would just say if you're if you're feeling overwhelmed and not sure where to begin, I'd say, you know, um, engage with some young folks in, in, in some of this work. And I'm always amazed at um, kind of not just the energy, but um, just the way it flips my brain upside down to think about um, some of these solutions. You know, I, I think a lot about how many of my students and, and many of the high schoolers I work with through um, Environmental Health Research to Action Program are, you know, they were born into a world where when they were in kindergarten, they were talking about climate change, right? And so I think that, um, you know, all of us can have those intergenerational conversations. And to me, um, that's some of the really powerful work that happens in Detroit as well that I see playing out and I'm, I'm proud to be part of. Wonderful, thanks, Natalie. Raquel? I like to just say that, um, you know, I tell people, cause we, we work with a few young people, not as many as Natalie, but, just the question, it's an orienting question. Where am I gonna lock in? I need to lock in, I need to research and be curious and call and talk to people and then bring five people with me. I need to know, I need to ask. And, and um, for me, I, this is new for me. I mean, I, you know, calling and, and uh, working on ordinances and talking to residents and saying, did you know that they can, they can downgrade the zoning right here so there's no more development on top of us, I mean, literally right here. And so, you know, people are so busy. They're so busy. They got kids, they've got jobs, you know? And so you, you're the voice, you're the person that's gonna connect folks. What are you gonna lock in on? Um, you know, what's your personal private tiny legacy? What change are you gonna leave? You know, what do you, what can you say you did, you know, for yourself and for your residents, your neighbors, your, your friends and family? Um, and know that it's gonna, you're gonna, I feel like it's like you dive in and the universe is like, yeah, you know, it, we, we're on a journey and it's been really fun, um, but you got to lock into something and you got to go be curious and it's going to be weird and new because if it's new for you, you're going to go learn it. And so, um, and just email any of us, we'll invite you in. So yeah, come on in. Beautiful, Raquel. Lapricia? Yeah, I, I sort of want to mimic what Raquel said. Um, get engaged and you will have wonderful folks that will encourage you and are very nurturing and very <laughs> kind. And that's what I've experienced in the last four months. I made a public, you know, I went to a meeting, a city council meeting and engaged in public comment. And I got three emails from folks. Oh, that was so great. And I thought it probably wasn't that great. But I appreciate <laughs> that they were just, you know, giving me credit for showing up and, and being engaged. And so that's really what we're all looking for. 
you just to get engaged. You don't have to do it perfectly. Um, you don't have to already know. You have wonderful folks that will coach you and hold your hand along the way, and we can fumble through it together. So you have all the websites. A lot of EJ, again, is reactive. And so just stay tuned and you'll find ways to plug in. I love that. And Irma to you. Thank you. It's been a true pleasure to be here. Um, we've talked a lot about resiliency in terms of like, what is the city doing or what are they doing? But, you know, it's also, what am I doing? You know, so a call to action. Um, there are things that we can all do. We talked a bit about recycling. So do that, do more of that, you know, push forward if you don't have it. Um, energy efficiency, uh, weatherization, you know, we need to get a handle on our greenhouse gases and buildings are the biggest source of greenhouse gas emissions, including our homes. Um, I am the rain barrel lady, so I'm going to say get a rain barrel, capture some storm water, keep it out of the <laughs> out of the storm drain, out of the sewer combined sewer system, but also plant rain gardens. I spent most of my early career with Sierra Club planting rain gardens. We've planted over 100. We being Sierra Club and our partner Friends of the Rouge, and just a shout out to them. They were on the call and they're still doing it. We're still planting rain gardens, uh, residents, people's homes. Uh, faith-based organizations, et cetera. A simple thing, stop using plastic, get rid of single-use plastic bags. It's, it, microplastics uh, you know, is a huge plague on our water, our air. We're eating it, we're breathing it in. So we've got to get a handle on plastics and let it start at home. Uh, compost, dig a hole out in the back yard and and put your food waste in it. Now, not technically dig a hole, but you know, it's easy to do. Just check it out um, and plant a tree. Call Faye, ask her some questions, how to plant a tree and just do that. If you're living in Detroit, contact the city of Detroit, uh, uh, G, G, GSW, G, GSD. GSD and the 10,000, you can get a free tree and the berm of your property. It's gonna capture Carbon dioxide, it captures particulate matter, 2.5, the thing that's affecting our asthma. So, and then vote, please vote and know who you're voting for and what they stand for. Contact them, ask questions and vote accordingly. Thank you. Be beautifully said. I will only add one extra item, which is if you haven't done your stint in public service, yeah, that's also something you can do because they work for us and you can be them. Um, and there's lots of ways to engage. Well, listen, I am so honored to have spent a good hour and a half with all of you on the panel, with the, those of you who have dialed in tonight um, and given up a little bit of your time with your family to, to spend with us. I couldn't be more honored that, to have moderated this panel with these amazing women. I'm looking forward to seeing you in person in town when it's safe, where it's safe. And in the meantime, um, you know, look for a note from us. The team will send out some follow-up resources for everyone who joined uh, so that you can participate in the ways that were described. But with that, I give the floor back to Fiotis if you're there and want to close yeah. us out. All right. Thank you, Carrie. And thank you, ladies. That was a wonderful talk. Uh, it was better than I even could have imagined or hoped for. I love the energy. I love the passion. I love the knowledge and information being shared. And you all were wonderful. Thank you all very much for supporting this effort. For those of you who came out and joined us today, I hope you found this worth your time. Uh, the Detroit Center is a meeting and engagements facility established by the University of Michigan in 2005 as a means of providing space for faculty, staff, students to conduct activities in the city of Detroit. As a part of the uh, Detroit Center staff, we try to leverage the space to, to bring together activities to mutually benefit Detroit and U of M community members. As we deal with the COVID-19 pan COVID pandemic, we have gone virtual. So we are tr still trying to engage virtually with activities such as this. Uh, be on the lookout, we're kicking off season two of our Distinctly Detroit podcast uh, in the next month, uh, in which we'll be interviewing individuals about their love, their love work, and time spent in the city of Detroit. And uh, we are very excited for that. And with that, I'm gonna thank everyone for coming out and say good night, God bless. And we appreciate all of you. And we will have a, uh, this recording up in the next month or so. And uh, please feel free to reach out to us at the Detroit Center if there's anything you need. 
Have a good night, everyone.